Hello, welcome. Uh, I am Claudio Panariello from uh, KTH. And uh, uh, yes, welcome today to, uh, to this, uh, today's uh, keynote speaker. And I'm very happy uh, to present uh, Oliver uh, Baum, uh, who is Associate Professor at uh, UNSW, Arts and Design in Sydney. Uh, just would like to say a few words about Oliver Baum. Uh, he has worked in the field of computational creativity since uh, 2007, and his research lies in the intersection between interaction design and complex systems deployed in a creative context, uh, aimed at understanding uh, uh, artistic and musical creativity using digital technology and its relation to society. Uh, combining uh, creative practice research, design research, and the anthropological methods Oliver Baum explores areas such as computational creativity, generative music and art, musical meta creation, and creative AI. So we are very honored to have Oliver Baum here with us today. So please give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Claudio, and thanks to all of the SMC organizers, Roberto, and everyone, um, and to KTH and KHM, I've got that right. Um, it's, uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I think my first SMC was 2009. It was one of the first conferences I went to doing my postdoc when I'd already moved to Australia, uh, then 2012. Uh, and I have, to, I have to confess that this is the first conference I've been to physically for five years. <laughs> there was a little... Uh, uh, virus going around and then um, I also had two children so I'm very very happy to be back in back in physical conference land it's really great um, so I'm going to try and talk about AI music and value this is a very broad talk uh, it's it's the subject of some of the work I'm doing at the moment and connected to the subject of my book uh, published in 2021 which um, any minute now is about to be switched to being open access um, so I hope in a, I don't know if it's actually like right now I asked if MIT Press could make sure it was done for this event, so maybe check. Um, otherwise, make a note in about a week or two weeks time to, to check. And if you've recently bought my book, I humbly apologize, but that's the way it goes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to do a little bit of taking stock of the present, um, talking about what's going on in AI, and this will be stuff that most people are very familiar with just from their news feeds. Most of my slides are going to consist of news feeds. Um, and consider what's at stake with music. And think about interdisciplinarity and how we are um, forever having to change our disciplinary arrangements and making the case that uh, under the present, uh, situation. There's an increased need to revisit and rethink our interdisciplinarity. And hopefully I'm completely convert, uh, speeching, uh, preaching to the converted here, and I'm not actually saying anything controversial. We can all agree over a drink later on. Um, and just to ask some questions about how sound and music technologists might drive this change. But I'm going to start with a little detour. And I promise this is the only generative AI I used to make my talk today, I couldn't help asking um, Dali to, to give me an image, which was supposed attempting to represent some, some new interdisciplinary, in, interdisciplinary combination of the human, the body, the mind, and the machines we work with. That was very, very quick prompting there. I'm not a, I'm not a prompt engineer. Um, but I want to go on a little diversion and introduce a theme. Uh, the theme is, is uh, evolution and evolutionary thinking. Um, stemming from Darwinian evolutionary thinking, but expanded massively. And I, I bring this up because it's part of my academic background. I studied evolutionary and adaptive systems, which is my entry point into doing digital and creative work um, with a much more of an A-life focus than an AI focus. And I've always been interested in evolutionary theory applied to culture and technology. Uh, and I'm raising this for the reasons of interdisciplinarity, because I've, I've more recently I've been working with anthropologists and social theorists, and I've been quite struck at how a lot of the work in that area is very evolutionary and yet keeps its distance, keeps a safe distance from evolutionary theory. So my provocation, if anything, to the social scientists is to is to rethink some of these. And I particularly want to draw attention to recent work 
recent developments in evolutionary theory with it really trying to go beyond the simplicity and the reductionism of uh, reducing behavior to selfish genes and um, simple selective processes and seeing uh, evolutionary theory working in a much more complex paradigm of multi-level selection. So there's a, a body of theory called multi-level selection theory, which I'm not going to explain in detail. I highly recommend um, a very readable book by David Sloan Wilson called This View, this View of Life, which got me back onto, onto this. And it's a really wonderful uh, capturing of the moment of, of where evolutionary theory has got to if you haven't been following. Um, so the basic idea there is uh, David, David Wilson has been a theorist of uh, the, the concept of group selection, the idea that uh, groups of humans can um, be units of selection as well as individual humans or, or any species for that matter. Um, and that essentially we should view evolutionary selection as never being completely focused on the individual organism. Sometimes we have selection that occurs within the body, between cells, between microbiomes and um, elements within us. Sometimes we have selection occurring on, on individuals, which is predominant, but not uh, exclusive. And sometimes we have selection occurring on, on larger groups. And we can think of those groups bringing in, drawing on sociology, drawing on, for example, Latourian thinking and all of the contemporary trends about um, complex human non-human assemblages as elements of selection. So I want to just drop that in there and then I'm going to kind of weave that throughout. Um, and, and just to give some more of that context, uh, this is uh, a quote from John Law, who's uh, kind of part of the actor network um, gang. And uh, his, in his book, After Method, makes a, makes a very strong case for how we need to really embrace the mess when we're doing social science work embrace the mess of and the complexity of those systems and um and challenge methods that are that, that draw not necessarily reductionist but that draw us down into into fixed ways of thinking to recognize that method is something that uh, we create and that we can that, that hugely influences how we think so john law says social science should be trying to make and no realities that are vague and indefinite because much of the world is enacted in that way um, that necessarily exceed our capacity to know them. So that's an important sort of um, rally for how we uh, ad adopt something like evolutionary theory. Um, so I'm taking an evolutionary process as any situation, very broad definition where a context is established in which a load of different actors appear and through that new patterns of behavior emerge through a frenzy of trial and error. That's my working definition, which is not published anywhere. So let's take stock of the present AI uh, revolution. So it's clearly a big deal. Here's, a, here's one of many graphs that show that in uh, investments in being big tech, mentions of AI has skyrocketed in 2023. It, it also skyrocketed in 2016 and plateaued and then skyrocketed again. We know why, because there's been some impressive breakthroughs. Um, uh, we can see that all over the place. We, we cannot possibly ignore what's going on. Uh, it's uh, being picked up at a rapid rate by companies. Um, and this is my first reference to a, an evolutionary process. There's uh, a process of different organizations uh, uh, competing in a marketplace um, for uh, success, um, and they're rapidly turning to AI to support them in that. We've got um, people saying that you can trust ChatGPT for um, for uh, financial advice, which is now something that they're very <laughs> cautious about. Um, and we've got every sort of company trying to uh, em employ this in some way. That's at the level of companies. At the level of people uh, within those organizations, uh, we've also got uh, interesting processes um, of adoption that don't necessarily follow what the company is trying to do. Um, strangely enough, this is sort of straight out of a movie, but on my flight over here, I was sitting next to a guy and we started talking because he saw that I was preparing a presentation on AI and music. And we started talking and he said he works in HR. And for the last six months, he's been exclusively, exclusively using ChatGPT uh, in his work and it's doubled his productivity and no one's telling him to do that. He's just been doing it off his own back. And I said, that's amazing. That's such a great example. I'll, I'll make sure I put that in my talk. And um, please, please, please make sure you check the output <laughs> when you're using this thing. Just don't, don't trust that it's gonna uh, do what you want. 
and we parted ways. Um, <clears throat> but here it is, it's appearing very rapidly in products. This is Salesforce. They've just announced this massive suite of GPT powered um, services, GPT embedded into every single part of their workflow and they're making this case. Um, so how exciting is this? The places you'll go, except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true. The bang ups and hang ups can happen to you. Everyone I think probably knows, uh, or probably has an opinion about where we might um, run into some trouble here, many different places. So you may be familiar with the hype cycle. Um, it's a useful, probably not super reliable, but very useful sort of guide for thinking about how um, technologies can be overhyped. And there's many reasons to believe that what we're looking at is overhyped. Um, the hype cycle predicts that generally when there's a breakthrough, um, you get you get this rush of expectation. So there's this idea of the peak of inflated expectations, which will result in a crash, the trough of disillusionment. And that can often re result in a massive um, bust period or in AI, we talk about AI winters. Uh, and then eventually things level out and they even out. So you could argue that we are in one of these peaks, or you could argue that because we've already been through a few busts and booms of AI, we're actually on this uh, plateau of productivity. There's different ways of seeing this. I don't take this too seriously, but it's a nice it's a nice guide for thinking about the history of investment and technology. Um, but even if current AI is a radical breakthrough, that's not to say, and very successful at what it does, that's not to say that people won't overinflate their expectations of what it can be used for. So it doesn't necessarily this doesn't necessarily say that the initial product concept is flawed it says that the that there can still be overinvestment there and that can happen in many different ways so not just that um, companies invest money and they realize that their products are not actually as good as they thought um, it can be manifest in this really vast range of dimensions of thinking about society and again um, that's why a multi-level view uh, can be really helpful so Here's a couple of a couple of debates, current debates about how AI is being pitched as something that's going to free up our time. Certainly, the guy I sat next to on the plane was telling me that this was absolutely the case. He works in HR of all uh, of all areas, and um, he sees this being amazing for uh, saving him time. Where this goes, nobody knows. Um, but there is a paradox here. There's a well documented paradox of time pressure. So Judy Waxman. Her work um, in in the sociology of work has pointed to how to how we're supposed to be constantly being offered time saving uh, services and technologies, and uh, they result in us being just as busy as we've always been. There's something else at play. Maybe we just love being busy. You decide. Um, there's a lot at play, and I won't go into that in detail. But you can picture what I'm talking about, and also. Um, Obviously, uh, there are situations where AI just simply creates more work, which I'll talk about a bit more. But this is so this is AI continuing a, a very long standing series of um, capitalist progressions that relate to how we work and how we exist. Um, it's not a one off, but we so we can see it as a continuum, but we can also see discontinuities, uh, significant transformations that we're not familiar with before. Just to give an example from my personal experience and this is to sort of try and say, hey, hey, AI, this is personal. Um, this is my band. It's on Spotify. And um, I uh, we very silly choice of name. There's about 15 Icaruses and there's a few others of the Icarus line. And um, who's that band? They've got a track. There's, there's, it's just a silly name. You should really make sure you choose a, a, a non-statistically significant name uh, when you name a band. But um, you'd expect the AI to be able to work out the difference. But there is a band. There's a Bristol duo two brothers my band is a uk based duo two cousins both making electronic music and we constantly get muddled and um this is automated systems um you know scraping and putting things together and i'm constantly fighting the ai to make sure that this track which is not mine is not listed um so that's a, just a, i'm just speaking from a personal experience but many 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 situations exist where we already battle against we're already being given work to do by these automated systems 
So I think of this as this is this tiny little nugget of not particularly significant concern. I think it is actually the, the, the core of the biggest threat of AI, which is that it blows up into this bunch of problems we have to solve. That's a sort of existential threat. And this is a picture of um, from a recent Australian government report. This is a diagram of what's going on in ChatGPT. Um, and the bit at the bottom is the actual GPT model, the large language model. All of the rest of the stuff is stuff that filters inputs, um, checks for appropriateness, um, tries to sort of discern certain factors, goes into the model, comes back out, goes back in, comes back out, uh, gets filtered, uh, you know, and maybe reiterated and so on. And this is where we're at. We're, we're, we're trying to basically build a framework around this uh, these particular breakthroughs. So technology evolves by uh, producing breakthroughs that then um, uh, need to become the focus of a whole load of extra work. Um, there's a great paper by um, Schlesing, Schlesinger et al. in um, CHI 2018. Uh, let's talk about race, identity, chatbots, and AI. And it's a great um, just sort of, it just exposes in a very nice way the work, uh, the, the ways that you can take a very clever language model, but it's, it's clever, but it's not clever. And so it gets wrapped in this very dumb um, sort of uh, filter that, that checks for certain keywords and just filters keywords. So one of the keywords is, is basically anything about race or anything about sexuality just gets filtered. And so these end up being very um, biased systems in a way that's different from the way they would be if, if they were just left, you know, that they say horrible racist things if you leave them untouched. And if you filter them, then, they, then they're then they just like taboo, well, let's not, not talk about race. And so either way around, you've, you kind of end up with similar problems. And, and, and these are problems that are gonna sustain and persist. And we're gonna be stuck with those in different ways for a very long time. Um, comparing to other technologies, let's just for a moment think of AI a bit like the internal combustion engine. It's a singular, or let's talk about specifically GPTs as um, like internal combustion engines. There's singular breakthroughs that result in massive transformations to life on earth, but they come with all of this other stuff that, um, that has to happen around it. That's what I'm describing. Um, so in this image, I wanna draw attention to this funny piece of glass that's been you know, strapped onto the front like an afterthought. Um, you know, maybe the drivers don't want bugs coming into their face. Uh, and um, it's just interesting to think of the car, not just as a single innovation, but as this massive assemblage and conglomeration of technical focus and design and sociological focus that we have, we all assemble around. So think about glass as part of the technological story of the car. Um, not just the internal combustion engine. And it's very interesting. Think, uh, imagine glass didn't exist. Imagine we lived in a physical reality where you couldn't have transparent solids and um, think about how that would massively transform what kind of cars we drive and when we drive and how safe it would be and so on. So these things really matter. And um, in really simplistic terms, then we can also think about how um, certain innovations sort of block out other certain innovations. So we might think that actually we, we've now opened this bag um, of, uh, of text-based AI. And it's really worth pausing to reflect, everyone is bored of this conversation, but it's really worth pausing to reflect how suddenly and radically that happened. And it's very poor in many ways and it's very incomplete. But um, I mean, I found myself in 2018 talk, uh, writing a paper about um, interaction design and generative AI and saying, um, you know, I, I, I tried to classify the, basically there's operation-based AI systems where you train a model and control its parameters and it's a bit like a tool. Um, there's request-based AI systems that would look a bit like Google. You just type something into a search box and it would generate. And there's ambient AI systems where the system is sort of um, operating around your activity, like in Photoshop when it's, uh, when it's sort of fixing backgrounds and things. <laughs> And the request, you know, in 2018, the request-based AI thing was just like, I, I was like, that'd be really interesting if that happens. And all of a sudden we are entirely in a world dominated by that paradigm. Um, not entirely. I've seen some great papers that are looking at other things, but um, you see what I mean? It's, it's sort of becoming dominant. Um, Genevieve Bell, the, um, the uh, anthropologist who spent many years working in Silicon Valley and Intel um, and being very closely engaged in the 
sort of anthropological critique and transformation of big tech. Um, in a recent keynote, she's been doing work recently on the Australian Overland Telegraph Line, the history of building a telegraph line across Australia. And she makes the case that narratives of tech determinism um, uh, need to be challenged by other narratives, by other ways of thinking about what um, what's happening historically at those times, how the, how the social, the political um, feed into those. So big tech breakthroughs are big tech breakthroughs. They are they are indisputable, but they still play out in social uh, processes. Um, and she says we need to destabilize those, those narratives of neat technical, technological accomplishments. Um, so I, I want to really flag how the current situation that we're in uh, really, really sort of doubles down and drives home that need for us to think in an inter interdisciplinary way and to think really broadly about what's going on with the technology that we're working with. And of course, I couldn't, um, I couldn't give this background without mentioning some of the more radical things that are happening, like Jeffrey Hinton. Um, quitting his job and saying that it's it's actually much more dangerous than he thought. And just again, asking that question, like how do we get to this situation where someone is is so much on one side and then suddenly flips and and where does Jeff Hinton turn? Um, you know, what, what frameworks is he now looking for and, and how come they weren't there? These are the kinds of questions we can really get into. Um, okay, so that was like a little bit of a, and I have very disconnected thinking. So for me, all of these things are connected, but maybe they're not. Um, that was a quick overview of some of the pointers about where we're at and just trying to frame frame um, different dimensions for thinking about what's going on. And now let's look a bit more at music. So uh, the image on the right is from one of those sort of industry tech reports that come from a... Uh, slightly unclear source and is making the claim that 59% of musical artists already use AI within their projects. I'm very interested to know what, uh, let's talk about this later, but I'm interested to know whether people think that's a, um, a realistic representation of what's going on. Um, I think it's probably in the context of being a tech report and trying to you know, position itself in an industry that's gearing up for AI is, is an example of you know, having slightly uh, leading uh, statistics um so maybe we can't trust that figure but um but we can certainly be sure that there's lots of people jumping on this movement um we've got already we live in a world where there is an art movement called promptism which uh, didn't exist five years ago and um and people are suggesting that this is you know, it's forming its own culture around around ai prompting much like photography or or drum machines and transforming practice I love to see some of the more bizarre things that people are doing as artists working with AI. I love, I love this example. Um, this is just from Twitter. I don't know who Matt Webb is, but he made an AI clock, which uh, tells the time in poetry. Great. Like I'm absolutely so keen for these kinds of projects. Um, and he notes that the poetry is uh, very positive and he's not quite sure why, because that wasn't programmed in there, but lucky, lucky him. Maybe, maybe suddenly it turns dark and he's not sure why either. Um, but these point to very interesting creative possibilities. Um, here's a pundit being interviewed about uh, the future of AI in music. And I probably broadly agree with what, um, what he's saying. Excuse me. Um, he's got four points. There's going to be a flood of mediocre, indistinguishable, unoriginal music. So the, this, is, this kind of points to the question of democratization when you make something easy you make it uh are we just going to be bombarded with badness i mean this is a topic that we can pick up and discuss a bit more and maybe it's very judgmental so i don't want to actually take the position that uh, i don't want to I don't, I don't want to lay down an aesthetic um position on that but it's an interesting observation um he claims that music libraries and production houses are going to see the most change so in the most commercial areas there's going to be the most change that's a, that's something i'd probably broadly agree with um but that there'll be other areas where uh there's much more um much more tradition um moving on to the third point we may see a, a counter movement where people are really against this and that's clearly happening right now um and lastly the artists who effectively use ai are gonna are gonna ride a wave because I, I think this is a very interesting point because we see this this is again a continue a continuation like artists performing live who play solo with a laptop the economics of doing that have transformed 
live music to some extent. Luckily, we still can see large orchestras and big bands and things. But this backlash, let's just look at this. So I, I spend a lot of time looking at uh, doing my AI research on Twitter, and I see a lot of this, like this tone that's really starting to emerge. I don't know if you can read that. Um, yeah, better than I can. Um, hey, could you make uh, can you make an AI that does things people actually don't want to do, like taxis, instead of ruining things we actually enjoy? This is this is really like starting to get established as a position against AI. Like it's very f foundational opposition to people using AI in music. Um, and uh, this special edition from the Experimental Emerging Art magazine does a really nice thing of comparing these two artists being interviewed, and all of the questions. You know, should AI generated art be considered proprietary of a property of the creator? Etc. These two artists have given absolutely polar opposite views, and they're, you know, similar age, similar sort of emerging artists. Um, there is a sort of bifurcation happening in culture. Lots of seemingly nefarious things are happening, like streaming services trying to generate their own songs so they don't have to pay artists, and all of this stuff we, you know, we've seen in the news and discussed, and people. Uh, might know streaming services from the inside better than I do and tell me if this is something that they're thinking about. Um, and um, I just want to check. I didn't miss. No. Um, so there's an interesting conflict here, which I think is also emerging, is that people want to defend artists and the right to make revenue from music but the, the, they, there's an interesting situation you end up with which is that you're defending that on the grounds of the um commoditization of, of music and there's a bit of a paradox which is you know how do we defend music revenue against something that's hyper capitalist but actually we're doing so, we're, the defense takes the form of a sort of capitalist position which is that you should be able to draw revenue from your labor um and and I just want to flag that that's I'm not taking one side or the other. I just want to flag that 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 should be considered a a bit of a um, contradiction or a bit of a challenge to think through. And that's part of the main message of this talk is to is to make sure that we're always getting into those nuances. We're always prepared to go and look at those nuances. Um, I won't try and talk too much about copyright, but just to flag that this is all hot stuff and up in the air. Um, Different countries have very different copyright laws. This is something that I'm slowly learning that that hugely impacts how we actually work through these things. Um, very interesting efforts are going on, such as um, Holly Herndon and um, uh, Matt Dryhurst, who, are, who have been driving this incredible movement to really like make people aware of their rights with respect to um, using their data being used for training. And this is another emerging area. Um, we've seen our first uh, music deep fake, which got put on Spotify and Apple Music and then got taken down. And so we're seeing the, the real time playing out of, of sort of case law in action. And we're also in a context, we've long been in a context where, where music streaming has been transforming how people think about music. So we have all of these really interesting examples of artists doing things on Spotify or, or elsewhere that are adapted to the context of Spotify. For example, um, the birthday crew have been making versions of happy birthday with different people's names inserted, like thousands of versions of happy birthday. Um, the Massachusetts man has been uh, using dozens of pseudonyms to make songs with really random place names because people might find that place name and play it. And, you know, these are completely like opportunistic efforts. And this is a great example of, a, of this kind of very broad idea of evolution that you, you create this playground and in that playground um, new behaviors emerge through a massive sort of process of trial and error. Um, no doubt AI will do the same. In the startup space, which is where I've been doing some research recently, and I, sh I actually didn't give the context of my current work, which is that I trained as an anthropologist. I trained, I studied an undergraduate anthropology degree very many years ago ended up going into tech, music tech, SMC sort of stuff, and very recently got involved in an amazing project called Music and AI, uh, an, a, a critical interdisciplinary approach led by Georgina Bourne. Everyone should check out her work and the related work in that project because it brings together exactly this kind of inter interdisciplinary mix. Um, so I've been trying to re 
I've been trying to shift. I think it's very healthy if we all once in a while try and shift our methodological stance. And I've been looking at um, startups from a more of an ethnographic uh, point of view, mostly interviewing workers and CEOs. So a couple of examples of this sort of experimental evolutionary playing out of what's going to happen in AI is happening in startup space. Uh, an example is Popgun, who renamed themselves to Splash. Uh, they they tried making some generative AI stuff, tools that people could use, and they realized that the market was tiny, or at least they, they felt like it was tiny. So they moved into Roblox, and they made a Roblox game where you could where kids could g pretend to be DJs um, using generative AI in the context so they didn't have to make a big effort, that they could just get on stage and play in this virtual environment. And very interesting what Stephen Phillips, the CEO, said in an interview in 2019, because this is very much startups to speak, uh, there isn't the place in the world where teenagers come together to make music for each other. That place does not exist, and that's nuts. This thing needs to exist, and it will exist. So like, what a, what a remarkable pitch to identify a gap in the market when, from my memory, we definitely got together and made music. Um, and I'm pretty sure the kids are still doing that. But, you know, this is, this is what happens with, with, in startup land, is, you, is you, you're making a pitch, so you push it as hard as you can. There's some truth to it, especially in, in, in a world where we've shifted to online. It's probably, there is a fair point there. Um, but it's tenuous, and we really have no idea whether that's going to play out. And Popgun's a really interesting company because after interviewing Stephen Phillips, I learned that he's very committed to that super agile way of doing startups. He'll work on a project for six months, see how it's going, ditch it. He said he ditched like 15 projects in the last four years or something and move on. So very, very evolutionary within the company itself. We have uh, Endel. People probably are more familiar with this company, Endel. Um, don't know if anyone's ever tried it. It's pretty good focus music. Um, and the basic pitch is that we're going to do generative music, generative infinite streams. You can choose whether you want to sleep or focus or um, work out. And it gives you music, functional music. It's a big, big theme now. You have functional music playlists on, on the main streaming services. Endel said, let's push this. It's going to be super curated, super scientific. We use all of the right frequencies and, um, and uh, pentatonic scales, very key to generative music, pentatonic scales. Um, and, uh, and I think this is really interesting because they, they pin a lot on AI, but actually, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I never plugged it into my... I don't even have a Fitbit, so I've listened to this stuff. I quite liked it, but I saw no need for it to be generative. It could just be, you know, production music. Um, so I'm very interested to see how this plays out. What is interesting with Endel, because they've been quite successful. I think one of the reasons they're successful is because actually when you go on Spotify and you say, I want to listen to focus music and your, you know, your favorite playlist come up, you get distracted and you listen to Drake or whatever. Um, uh, so... It's actually quite interesting, simply the fact that you just need a different app. You just need to go to a different place. So maybe all of this pitch is not actually necessary. Um, but what's interesting about Endel is that they've got to a place where they're, in, they're, 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 they're quite successful. They've got subscribers, very simple model. It's just a subscription model. Uh, and now they're doing lots of integrations. Endel integrated into your car, into you know building lobby and so on. We've all talked about this kind of idea for years, but they're in the best position of anyone to now do this. And again, an evolutionary um, set up they've created the framework powerful generative ai engine not much ai just generative system really um and and they're ready to be available for all of these contexts and they can just see which ones fly so very interesting company to watch okay so quick overview basically of music and i'm running out of time already and i knew i'd go over so i will try and be respectful of your time so um how should the interdisciplinary landscape adapt so let's look a little bit more at the sociology side. And here's a couple of you know, books that uh, represent interesting work going on in the study of creative practice beyond the SMC music tech world. Um, what, the, the name's pretty good at telling you what this is about. Can music make you sick? Um, music, that's, that's counterintuitive. Music, we always talk about music as being healing, as being, about, being positive. Um, but there's a lot of work at the moment looking at the, 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 the sort of cultural baggage and challenges of music culture. So the big thing here is in a capitalist context, 
uh, individuals go out and try and be mus musicians and they face these huge mental uh, social challenges they have to make their life their work they have poor revenue unstable conditions and so on this can have massive negative uh, mental health issues and that's what this book looks into and similarly culture is bad for you the name gives it away um, looking at culture looking at the flip side looking at the lack of inclusion looking at how um, cultural industries do have deep problems underlying them so these are really important frameworks and we might, as a community, engage more with those frameworks. Um, speaking of frameworks, so on the right here is a fairly old paper, 2004, a big overview of attempts, a massive overview of the benefits of the arts in every dimension. So it, it actually breaks this down into instrumental benefits, which are basically more sort of measurable and tangible, and intrinsic benefits. Um, and then on the horizontal axis, public and private benefits. I'm going to I'm going to move a bit faster so I won't break this down but it's a nice framework I've recently submitted a paper that tries to bring this and apply it to AI music debates um, and we can look at many examples of this kind of work so we should engage with these frameworks and get to know them really well even if you're just doing the lowest level music tech research because you um, are ultimately doing work that in, impacts and interacts with those back to generative AI um, wonderful paper from uh, last year's HCI Generative Akai, HCI and Generative AI conference by Aaron Jackson and co. Um, looked at the sort of idea of meaning in generative work. This was a load of experimental work that, that developed imagery inspired by African-American experience, different terms, different themes. And this, this sort of did a practice-based investigation into what on earth it can possibly mean to uh, you know, that for there to be cultural meaning in these kinds of generated images. Going back to intrinsic benefits, one of one of the important ones is the um, one of the important social ones is the collective expression and collective development of identity. And I think there's lots of work that needs to be done in this area because it's something that we all intuitively understand, but we don't have um, great models of and so on. Um, and I think it's important to again notice the nuance there that in AI we potentially might find that AI and its democratizing capabilities, which I put big scare quotes around, um, we might um, uh, find that AI creativity can support expression in various ways, but we also have to question that and see what its meaning is, what the underlying drivers are for establishing meaning in artistic practice. Okay, I've got a, I've got a time dilemma now, so what shall I skip? Let's see, I'm gonna jump to um, just to flag another paper that I think has been very interesting and relevant recently, which is um, Siddharth et al. Um, it's a it's a it's a tech report um, how AI fails us, and it makes this very interesting case about the basic, the most basic um, uh, philosophical stance that AI research takes, which is individualistic, so autonomous individual uh, intelligence, um, as compared to uh, the idea that is is now really prevalent in the social sciences and study of creativity, which is that we really ought to be taking a strongly social frame. That may be obvious for social scientists, but a strongly social frame um, for thinking about intelligence. And that actually, some fundamental ideas about AI could be re could be shifted quite radically. And they say from excuse me, they say from um, actually existing AI a EAI to actually existing digital plurality and they may build an argument around the concept of digital plurality AI systems um, don't really serve plural pluralistic goals and actually that's very closely connected to how this is uh, this sort of establishes this evolutionary competitivism so on to interdisciplinarity um, I'm a big fan of this very old paper by Donald Campbell, who was a, who was a very broad evolutionary theorist, um, who makes the case that um, interdisciplinarity gets stuck in clumps. Again, it's an evolutionary view. Um, we get sucked into our interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary specifics for, due to a variety of sort of attractive and repulsive forces, a bit like magnets. Um, and, the, you know, we, and, and, and this is counterproductive. There are huge gaps. And so he thinks in terms of like the gaps between disciplines and how we should fill those gaps. So he proposes this fish scale model. This is an ideal 
vision of what inter interdisciplinarity should look like. So I think that's a lovely idea. I don't totally agree with it because I don't think that, I mean, what, one interesting thing about that is it was not in the context of the sort of more relational thinking that we, we have now. It's probably just completely hopeless to be thinking about that sort of complete fluidity. Um, so I think better to think about how those clumps just, just to be constantly aware of and questioning those clumps is actually the best we can do, and maybe to spread them out and fill some of the gaps a bit better. Um, and by contrast, much more recent work, again, Georgina Bourne um, and her partner, uh, Barry, uh, Andrew Barry, um, have done a great analysis of interdisciplinarity in different fields. And they, ba they basically propose three really broad relationships. And the important thing here is that they're pointing out how different disciplines have different relationships between them. So this is a much more relational framework. So there's an integrative synthesis um, model where we bring two subjects together and synthesize and integrate them. And that's a, in a way a kind of ideal, but in slightly more realistic in various contexts is a subordination service model where one subject is brought in to serve another. And we see that a lot between technology and um, creative practice, say, and an antagonistic model, agnostic antagonistic model where so where critical theory type subjects are brought in to challenge and create this sort of productive antagonism. So those are that's a useful framework for helping us think through um, the ways that we might creatively put disciplines together, being aware that these often become ne necessitated through the relationships, through the goal that's being sought. Um, and I just had to put this diagram up because I love how massive and chaotic it is. And I think, again, it's like, it's the mess. Welcome to the mess. This is um, uh, Hazel Smith and Roger Dean's book on practice-led research and research-led practice. And I give this to uh, PhD students because it's like, I mean, I wouldn't take this too literally, but it's like this crazy map of how you can navigate through academic research in the creative fields. And sometimes you're creating art and you're doing reflection, or maybe you're doing audience studies. Sometimes you're doing tech and you're having to benchmark and test things and do measurements. And um, very similar is my ex-PhD supervisor, Grant Wiggins, um, did some work about methodological clarity in the automation of the compositional process, Pearson Wiggins from around 2004. Um, just the, the, the bottom line here is, if you're asking a question, make sure you've connected the dots between the question you're trying to ask and the, and the process you, you follow to um, get there, which is standard academia, but um, it's worth reiterating that there are these kind of maps that we can follow. Um, I felt I was gonna talk a bit about my own work. I won't, we can talk about that in the pub. Um, so I'm gonna try and wrap up. So how should sound and music technologists, technologists drive this change? Uh, I don't have a really good excuse for putting this in, but I just really wanted to put it in there. Um, when I think of AI, AI's um, progress, I love to think of this section from my favorite Asterix um, book when I was a kid. This is um, Christmas Bonus, the Roman general, who just thinks he's just taken the, um, the, the magic potion that makes him strong. So he goes and tries to lift up a tree and it doesn't work. He's like, oh, maybe I was being too ambitious. Let's try this rock, that doesn't work. And he tries a smaller rock, still doesn't work. Finally, he picks up this pebble. He says, I've done it, I'm a superhuman. And um, his advisor comes along and says, that's just a pebble. And he drops the pebble on the, on the guy's foot, which I think is just, it's a good metaphor for sort of failure in AI or, or, or overcommitment to possibilities. But I love the final drawing because it sort of suggests this, uh, you know, what about the implications of your failure? You've dropped a pebble on someone's foot. Um, so what should we do? I mean, um, I think one of the really important things is that we should engage, think deeply about how we look for funding. And one of the one of the big challenges, every academic has to find funding and you have to do jump through hoops to get funding. But we really need to um, take all of these things into consideration. This is at the very least when we're looking for funding and funding in service of industry and the economy uh, can be very problematic. And at the very least, we need to be able to um, engage with the critical disciplines, with the social science disciplines, and actually have a framework in which we're, when we're asking for money, we're thinking about um, what kind of deal with the devil we're doing. Um, 
And I think there are really positive, productive ways we can do that, because I think every company out there that's trying to do AI at the moment uh, has has a lot of concerns about ending up on the wrong side of history or the wrong side of um, moral and legal frameworks. They are human beings after all. Uh, and our governments are very keen at the moment to, to sort of keep an eye on this. There is a lot of attention paid to it. So I think there's a great opportunity right here, right now that, that you're not, that you're pushing that as the, as the message that comes out first. Um, not we're going to make tech that makes, you know, is more productive and democratizes music creation uh, without sort of digging deeper into why you do that and so on. Um, so I think that's, that's enough from me. Uh, because I think there were supposed to be some questions, but um, I actually decided I would say any comments instead of questions, because I've said enough, and I'm sure that there's a lot of thoughts that spin off the back of that. Thank you. That's all for this. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, extremely inspiring talk. And I guess we have uh, some time for, uh, I guess I will be in front of the camera. Uh, I guess we have some time for a few questions or comments or. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Um, one question about the or a comment when you when you say or when you apply evolutionary thoughts to to company starts up well, what is happening there. I just had some conversations lately with um, companies working in voice over um, and uh, the comment was very much like um, it is very crucial to get things out very, very, very quickly. So there's this time component there and I was just wondering how does that fit into evolution? I mean, if things have to, um, if there's an extreme pressure to be very fast in bringing out models, for example. Okay, well, I will take that as a question. <laughs> That's a good comment. Um, yeah, so I think that ties into, I mean, we, I, I think most people will know about kind of agile methodologies, you know, because because uh, software development famously would always sort of disappear into a wormhole and become massively overpriced, you know, uh, over budget. And so we developed, you know, in, in startup world and in design, we've developed this amazing framework of agile design thinking. Um, and, you know, was it move fast and break things is, is sort of still the paradigm for a lot of people, although it's been challenged and it's, it's a point of debate. But yes, I think, um, in the broader startup world, you've got investors kind of spread betting on different technologies. Um, and that's the philosophy is that you just you sort of back a whole area and one of them will succeed. And then you've got within companies, you've got basically spread betting within different products. So moving fast is part of it. Getting it out there is so important because um, you can spend all your time working on something and but if it's not being user tested, so it's the live user testing that's that's key. Um, and very bad products can be very successful because they just capture a certain thing that somebody needs to do. And I think that's really important to recognize. So, and th these things can be locked in. So uh, I'm not sure if there was a specific question and if I've offered a specific answer, but these are things we need to look at. I think that's a really good point. And yeah, I think that's a that's cause for 
just just remembering that some of the visions of you know complete AI takeover of music production and so on are always going to be tempered by human concerns, and that's as as the the pundit said, you know, there'll, there'll there'll be some areas where this happens and some areas where it doesn't. The more human facing areas, you know, even if people are extensively using AI to speed up their process, then they're still they're still there. And yes, I don't think replacing the audience makes any sense <laughs> but it's a very interesting sort of proposition you know i think we've we've been looking at boomy uh, and they're the sort of really profound claim that they've produced 17 percent of the world's recorded music ever which is just such a fantastic nugget of thought provocation from a startup company and they claim that um they have a team of people that listen to all of that music uh maybe not all of it but they have some process there's the boomy process they you know there's there's humans involved in making sure that this stuff can go on spotify it can't just go up automatically but um they're they're really at the forefront of that kind of weirdness that we might have to get stuck into too Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, you're alluding to the fact that um, there's a world of possibilities, but there's a, a hugely complicated socio-technical process that, I, that that sort of teases out certain possibilities. And to some extent, that's by design, but it's always kind of ultimately evolutionary because the designers are part of that system as well. Um, so yeah, you know, the whole system of roads and cars. I mean, as as a as a case in point, I live on an island, and uh, I would love a car boat. I would really love a car boat because I could just drive my car straight into the water and park it up. Um, and they're not easy to come by. And there's many, many technical, social reasons why that's the case. I'd love to talk more face-to-face -face with, with people for the rest of the conference. <laughs>